Okay, so now we need to talk about moving up in levels of organization. We need to work on organs and organ systems and organism. So, as it turns out, cooperative interactions within organisms promotes efficiency in the use of energy and matter. What that means is that you have whole areas or compartments of your body that perform subsets of functions related to energy and matter. Example, we have a mouth which brings in um, high energy foodstuffs. We have an esophagus that takes that down to our stomach. We have a stomach here, this green thing here, which actually receives uh, food from the esophagus. The stomach in this region right here um, tends to break down uh, proteins into small polypeptides and uh, liquefies the food. And then the food goes into an intestine. Uh, the small bowel, which in this diagram is not shown well, uh, but that leads then to a large bowel, which then evacuates the food from the body. Meanwhile, we also have you know lungs that have another entry point out here just above where the mouth is. That's your nares and nose, and that brings air into this discrete area for uh, the purpose of gas exchange. So basically, within an organism, you've got all kinds of specific organs that are dealing with matter and energy. The lungs are providing the oxygen so that foodstuffs, once they reach the cells from being pumped around the body by the heart and blood vessels, they can be burned by glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport system. Uh, the stomach basically digests proteins and sterilizes food. The heart pumps blood with nutrients from food all over the body. The lungs exchange gases with the atmosphere so the food can be processed for energy. And the brain gets to remember how to do most all of this stuff uh, by storing information on how to get uh, the food and where to find the food. So a specific organ system to talk about here as a showcase is the urinary system or the excretory system. Um, within multicellular organisms like humans, there are are all kinds of organ systems. We had to pick one. So in the human body, we have kidneys, ureters, bladders. Uh, let's get that cleaned up. So we have kidneys, ureters, bladders, and the urethra. And they're each specialized for filtering blood. The kidneys remove nitrogenous waste from the blood with tiny filtration units called nephrons. This is a nephron. And the nephron basically is going to collect waste products from the blood and then drain them uh, to what is called a pelvis. That's this region here in the kidney. And then the urine from the pelvis drains down a ureter to the bladder. The bladder then, when it's appropriate, is pressurized and we push the urine from the body through the urethra. So... Let's talk about how the nephron works. You see this red ball of capillaries here. Blood goes in there through those capillaries and chemicals leak. And they leak into this uh, pale orange tube. That pale orange tube actually takes the leaked chemicals um, and pushes, by active transport, pushes the chemicals that are worth saving back into the bloodstream leaving behind mostly nitrogenous waste to go down through the loop here. The loop's job is to make this whole area right through here really salty. So as especially the fluid comes up through the other side here, salts are being pumped out and fluid is hardcore salty here. Then as the fluid goes through this tubule here called the distal tubule, remaining salts and things that are inside this fluid are pumped into the back into the blood vessels, see the little ribbony red blood vessels that are all around here. And then it comes to this duct here. This is called the collecting duct. And you'll notice the collecting duct look like it has, looks like it has branches on it. Those are other nephrons leading in. As the urine comes through the collecting duct, water from the collecting duct can osmose out into the salty fluid that was made salty by these loops. So the way the kidney works is fluid modification. You actually leak all kinds of nutrients out of your blood into this orange tubule. What you do then is you systematically pump useful chemicals back into the blood, leaving behind the waste products. I want to point out there's actually no way to directly filter waste products out of the blood. 
So what your body does is it filters first by chemical size, small chemicals, molecular, small molecular size chemicals leak into the tubes here from the capillary bed. And then any useful chemicals that are in the tube are pumped back to the blood, leaving only waste products, which are always small, to be urinated ultimately from the body. Once those all the way through the tubes and out, they drain into the pelvis, which drains down the ureters and out of the bladder. So nephrons are so complicated. This gadget is so complicated that you basically cannot replace these. So if you lose your nephrons due to trauma or infection, you end up, you end up on dialysis, which is artificial um, blood filtration for the rest of your life. Uh, nephrons, so they can't be replaced. The pelvis of each kidney has major ducts that drain to it from the collecting ducts which are coming from the nephrons. Your bladder holds the urine until it's appropriate to urinate and the urethra allows the urine to flow uh, out of the body. Uh, next, interactions among cells of different populations of organisms often work with each other to make amazing things happen that are also related to energy and matter. Turns out, classic example of this is the ruminant digestive tract. Ruminants are hoofed mammals, that is like cows and pigs and horses. Uh, they have usually have four stomachs. Not all of them do, but many do. Uh, cows do. And the four stomachs are for the di digestion of food. Pigs, for example, do not have four stomachs, but cows do. Uh, basically, the, there's the abomasum. Uh, and the omasum and the reticulum and the rumen. The ruminant stomachs, uh, the abomasum is the only acidic chamber. Chamber. Uh, the abomasum leads into the small intestine. Food from the esophagus first goes in the rumen and it uh, goes into, I, I can't remember whether it's omasum or reticulum, but then from there, it, I believe it goes from rumen to reticulum to omasum to abomasum to small intestine. And uh, in these chambers, except for the abomasum, in the rumen, omasum, and reticulum, there are microbes. They, these stomachs are alkaline, which are the opposite of like the abomasum and the human stomach, which is acidic. Um, inside of these chambers, there are lots of bacteria and some fungi. And what they do is they break down cellulose using this enzyme cellulase, which the cow does not have and most animals, no animals have. And it breaks the glycosidic bonds of cellulose into uh, goofy compounds like vinegar, propionic acid, and hydroxybutyric acid. At that point, then, those bacteria can use that for fuel, but so can the cow. They, so by having these bacteria in these chambers, the cow can then get the benefits of digesting cellulose. Without these chambers, the cow cannot eat grass and benefit from it. The, um, the strategy here is that the, um, this is a symbiosis, a mutualistic symbiosis. The bacteria are getting a place to live and are being fed by the cow. They in turn provide nutrition for the cow in the form of small, organic compounds, which the cow can then use as an energy source. The abomasum's job is to sterilize the, the food as it comes then towards the small intestine so that the bacteria cannot get into the small intestine and potentially hurt the cow. So the rumen and the omasum and the reticulum are where the bacteria grow. The abomasum, they die. And then any uh, of the food chemicals that go in the, uh, come from there go to the small intestine where they can be absorbed into the blood. So together, as a group, they not only complement each other by producing compounds that each other need, they also produce compounds needed by their mutualistic host, the ruminant, that's the cow. Now, the last topic to talk about is variations in molecules, which I'll talk about in the next lecture.